Welcome to my podcast, Running This Life on Your Terms. In this episode, I have a special guest and friend of mine, Robert Tadros. How are you, mate? Very good, my friend. How are you, Chris? Very good. Now, for those who don't know, Robert's a multi-award winning entrepreneur. He started his technology company, Impressive, one of three companies he's currently running. And he's been recognized as one of the fastest growing technology companies by Deloitte. So first of all, well done. Tell us a bit about that, Robert. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and thanks for having me. Um, mate, I, I've been in, the, uh, I guess, the digital marketing tech space for, for a bit over a decade now. Um, I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. I've failed a lot. Uh, I've won a lot. Um, and, you know, the, the most, I guess, successful story is, is impressive itself. Um, you know, I, I guess you could say I'm blessed to be, to be surrounded by very talented marketers um, and, and tech heads. Um, which is, you know, a, a big part of a, a successful business, as I'm sure you can you can appreciate, right? Um, so, yeah, look, last year we we entered the Deloitte uh, Fast 50, and and we we got nominated um, or crowned as the 15th largest uh, in Australia. Now, to put things in perspective, Afterpay I think was number six. Um, now, look, yeah. You know, to different businesses, I get it, you know, different revenue numbers and, and, and all the rest, but it was a big award for us to, to, to win and be crowned um, with such a big, um, a big nomination, right? And, 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 a, and a big award. Hasn't been, hasn't been easy, Chris, right? It's, it's been challenging like every, like most businesses, right? I don't think anybody's ever had a rosy, a rosy road to success, um, but it's been a bloody exciting one. Um, so yeah, look, uh, it's, it's probably the most prestigious award that we've had so far um, and definitely one that I'm very proud of and, uh, and I leave behind my desk and not the one at home, but the desk at work. <laughs> well, look, you said it's very proud for your business. I think it's a great accolade for any business. So to be recognized and that's amazing. And um, since 2016, you started and now you've developed an eight figure turn, turnover business, which is massive. So you've obviously grown and scaled and you said you've had your challenges along the way. I know many business owners, Rob, and I don't know one, that hasn't said that, that has a smooth road. I know every year I'm losing hair and I'm going greyer by the day, especially being at home in COVID. So I think that's standard. But looking at, um, looking at your business, actually knowing you, it is getting harder, but I think we've become more equipped to deal with uh, more pressure, to deal with larger staffing issues. And today being the fact that, say, you okay, Dan, I see that people are talking a lot about mental well-being, especially during COVID. What do you think about that? And I know you've been quite vocal on LinkedIn about how important mental well-being is for you and your team. What do you say to businesses out there or business owners that are working from home, that are struggling, that are trying to grow their team, they've got revenue challenges, their revenue's dropping, or it might even be growing, but they've got growing pains. You can't train your team because you've got new people on. What do you say to those people? Chris, you said it, man. Like, there's no doubt about it that we are going through some of the hardest times in our lives. We'll probably never experience anything harder than this uh, again. But again, I guess who, who knows, right? So we're all human. Naturally, I think we've all got emotions. We've got feelings. You know, um, some of us have a, a, a much higher threshold. You know, like you and I were talking earlier before the podcast. And look, you know, our resilience and I guess, you know, we can take a lot. Right, we we can adapt. So we can we can you can we can we operate under pressure, but unfortunately, others are not the same. And we you know as leaders, we need to identify that and just accept it. We need to accept that we also are human and that we need to be vulnerable. You know, and like you said, I am very vocal, and I put up a post the other day on LinkedIn and said, you know, yes, I am seeing a, a leadership therapist. Um, you know, I've never run a business of sixty-five people during COVID before. I don't know how to deal with it right? <laughs> you can throw anything else at me and, I'm, and I'll figure it out, right? But this has been tough. Um, and absolutely, look, you know, revenues up and down like a yo-yo, you know, you lose clients, you win clients, the, the morale within the team, the capacity of their, you know, their working capacity. A lot of these guys are working over time because they've got nothing else to do. So they're stuck in front of the computers. And now we're having the conversation of get out of like, just move, bro, go for a walk, just leave, leave the house, try and go and exercise, do something to get your mind off work. Yeah. Because the biggest trap that they found themselves in is like from eight o'clock in the morning till God knows what time at night, all they do is work. Now I've got nothing else to do, but they're bored, right? Um, and that is actually starting to have a negative effect. You know, for a lot sure. of business owners, they think this is great. You know, I'm getting more out of my team. And sure, you know, but what you don't realize is, is the mental health effects that it has on these people. 
right? And, and, and these employees. So look, I think as leaders, we need to be vulnerable. We need to really lead from the front and be vocal about this topic because it is a topic that um, needs to be spoken about and it needs to be put in the, in, in, in the, in the limelight, right? Um, there's no shame, there's no ego, you know, I think everybody goes through it to, to a certain degree, right? And, and, I, and I think just like we go and see a personal trainer to get fitter or a dietitian, we go see a psychologist and there's no, there's no shame in that, right? Like why is it that we, we can sit here and, and, and be very happy about, oh, I'm seeing a nutritionist now and a, and a personal trainer, um, but, you know, if I was seeing a psychologist, I'm not going to tell anybody because I feel embarrassed or shame. There's, not, there's none of that, right? You know, you make a good point. I think we're all a little crazy, but not only that, I think I always say asking for help is a strength, not a weakness. Identifying that you need help is a strength because when you get stronger and you have the ability to lead better, you're going to help more people anyway. And I look at someone I look up to very much, Dana White, who runs the UFC. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know, they bought, uh, him and the Fatita brothers bought it for five minutes, sold it for four billion. Very good businessman hard-nosed, amazing. And he was the first person to bring sporting back with no crowd, first person. And he said, how is it? Now he goes, this is the hardest thing I've ever done, including buying and building the UFC times a million. Now, yeah. if you've got someone that's as mentally tough as Dana White saying that, I think it's pretty safe to say anyone in that case feels the same. When you said people working out, it's also a burnout, but it's also counterintuitive because if you're working 20 hours a day, what sort of product, what sort of quality of work you're bringing out? And even if it's good, you're going to burn yourself out mentally, physically, emotionally. And it means you're going to burn out a lot quicker. And I've been involved. I've burned out before in the past. And I see that with my team. And I see the signs of burnout, seeing emails coming at different times, seeing how they're responding, how they're reacting. And I think it's very important as a leader to be, and I see Simon Sinek talk about a lot, leading with empathy, but understanding you're having a bad month. Don't go in hammering them about you're having a bad month. Why are you having a bad month? How can I assist you? And yeah. getting out and walking, I do that every day with my leadership team. I do, I do that with all of my managers. I speak to them. We're outside walking. We have 15-minute catch-ups. And I think it gets people in the right frame of mind. And once a week, I try to call all my team. It's about 50, 60 of them. And I just ask them, how are you going? Is all, are you all good? That's it. Just a quick That's question. great, Chris. And that's... Yeah, I think that's a very important point, man. Like I, I've um, started, I've developed something very similar to you. I have all my meetings now, 90% of them, while I walk. It's what I do now. So a lot of my, a lot of my meetings, even if they're on a hangout or a Zoom, I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm out walking. Um, and that in itself, I found, is, 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 has been amazing. And I'm starting to, to push a lot of the team members to say, get off your chair, go outside and go for a walk. You know, you can still work and, and conduct a lot of things. So it's great to hear that. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. Now, I've got a few questions. So I have to ask, because you're a digital expert, you've worked with hundreds of companies all around the world. Why is it important for, for businesses to have a digital presence, especially in 2020? Oh, man. Where, how long have you got? <laughs> you guys uh, look, the key the, points. Look, the, the importance is, um, number one, we're all stuck at home, right? We're as, as consumers, or if it's B2B or B2C, right? We're all stuck at home. We're consuming so much media right now, whether it's TV or social or, you know, what, whatever that, that may be. If you just, you don't have to go far. Look at some of the e-com, the e-commerce um, spikes that we're starting to see. We, even though we don't even, we're in a recession, as, as consumers are spending so much money, it is, it is ridiculous. So as a business, um, even just as a, as, a, as a retail business or a B2C business, if you don't have online presence, you'll be, you're done. Like there is no more. Dinosaur. You're pretty much a dinosaur, right? There's no, there's no more of this, oh, we're, going, we're going through a digital transformation. That's done. We're going through digital innovation at the moment, right? It's oh. like, how are you innovating? Not... Are you still thinking about how do we transition into the digital landscape? Like that was 2015. Um, so I think to, to the, the right question that I'd, I'd probably challenge that, right? The right question there is like, in the online space, how can I be innovating to accommodate for the fact that everybody is at home? And can, how can I take, as bad as it sound, you know, advantage of it? Because there's a lot of advantages right now, right? And one I mentioned before is that we are consuming so much media. So how do you leverage that, that, that amount of, you know, the eyeballs or the traffic? Um, so I think the right question there is like, how do you innovate? And I'm seeing some really cool things come out, you know, whether it's augmented reality or, or you know, or, or VR. Um, 
you know, Nike is leading the way with, with a lot of this. Rolex is starting to do some really cool things as far as um, augmented reality. And I know both of us love our watches, so I thought I'll, I'll, I'll drop Rolex in there. Um, yeah, but, but the ones that have really embraced it and have looked at digital innovation rather than transformation are the ones that are definitely going to lead the pack. The ones that are still thinking about digital transformation, I'm sorry to say it, but you're, you're done. You know, it's going to be very, very hard. Interesting point, Robert. And I'm a business owner and I don't take offense to that. And if anyone is, I don't say, where can we, where do, where's there an angle here? As a business owner, I look at angles. So when I go do something, where's the angle? Yeah. Here? How can I add value? How can I monetize this situation? And for me, I think that's a great thing as a business owner. And also as a leader, I think it's our moral obligation to find angles where we can monetize it so we can put more money into our team. We can add better service to our clients. We can add more value. So for me, I know it might be frowned upon some of the terminology that we use, but for me, I absolutely love that. And I think it's essential in today's age to be looking for opportunities in the marketplace. Is it tough? Of course it's tough. I'm not saying don't be mindful of people going through struggles and stuff, but I'm saying as business owners, we need to find our opportunities where we can, we can monetize it and grow our businesses. So I love that. Now, man, hundred percent. You don't have to like think about Alibaba like in the last pandemic. Look at Alibaba now. It's a monstrosity of a of, of a business, right? When Sams was around, like they that they, they didn't exist, and they used that opportunity to grow such a, a monstrosity of a of, of a business, right? Um, so yeah, look, there's 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 plenty of opportunities out there. I did a post recently, and I I said that's a big call. I think we're seeing we're going to see the biggest disparity in wealth in our in our time with so many people actually moving. Like you look at Bezos, you look at Elon Musk, you're going to see the biggest transfer in wealth. You're going to see the biggest companies come up, the next wave of companies, and hope we don't see another pandemic. But I really stand by that. If it's not the biggest in our lifetime, it's definitely going to be one of the most. Now, a couple of questions. How did you pivot to, to with COVID and lockdown? What are some of the suggestions you got for business owners? Now, you mentioned a few about mental well-being, about walking and doing your meetings. Give me a couple more. Yeah, look, we, we were lucky because in the digital landscape, you know, for, for us, um, we can work from pretty much anywhere. All I need is an internet connection and a, and, a, and a laptop, right? So we were able to transition the team in literally 24 hours, the entire 65 people from an office to working to, to working from home. So I guess we're, we're lucky in that, in, in that sense. But I guess some of the biggest tips is like, um, you know, even just the basic fundamentals, Chris, you know, like the, the amount of technology that is out there at the moment, you know, I speak to a lot of business and they're like, oh, we use Teams or we use Zoom or we use Slack or we use FaceTime, we use Skype. You know, there's so many, there's a plethora of different platforms out there. And I think the biggest advice that I can give is do your due diligence, right? Because everybody's using Zoom, it doesn't mean Zoom is the right platform for you, 100%. right? So do your due diligence, understand what your requirements are as a business, then go to market and figure out what the best piece of technology is or the, or the, the piece of tech that you could, that you could use. Um, look, you know, for us, we've been heavy Slack users. That's just as, a, as, a, as an organization, as a, as a business. For others, they, you know, they can't stand Slack. You know, they would rather use Skype. So there isn't a one size fits all. Um, the biggest pivot that we, I guess one of the biggest pivots that we did was, you know, once we actually transitioned to the online space and had everyone working from home is we, we did a very extensive um, tech stack analysis. We reviewed uh, every single piece of software that we use and is it pandemic proof? Like we, the best like question that. was, I love that. Pandemic. is it COVID? Is it COVID proof? You know, like if there's something COVID 20 was to hit, you know, is our current tech stack the same tech stack that we would take with us um, for a lot of businesses? You know, they never use the Skype or a or a Zoom or or, or any sort of you know um, piece of communication tool. So to them, once COVID hit, they're like, "Oh shit, we actually got to find trouble. something. We're in trouble here, right?" So I think do your due diligence is my biggest piece of advice, and be it just be one step ahead because you just don't know. No one knew COVID was going to hit. We no, I didn't predict it. You predict it? I don't think anybody did. You're not <laughs> right. I'll tell you this, I'll say this. I think the best time to prepare for a pandemic, and I've said this, is when there's no pandemic. The best time to prepare for your retirement is before you retire. So That's in other right. words, put everything you can in place. So for me, I've used this as an opportunity to order my business. We use Slack and now we're going to Teams because we think it's a little bit better, but it's a good chance to order your business. And even if you might not get the revenue that you might lose in the course of the next three, six, 12 months, if you put the right things in place, whatever you've lost here, you're going to gain there in momentum. So as long as you can stay mentally fit and strong and you can audit your business, I said to my team, I want to come out of this with something to show. 
better systems, better structure, better auditing. I want to look at everything. I want to now audit and stress test every part of our business. And I think the very, doing- very, very important point you just made right there. And, and it's something that I've been promoting is use this time. There's two ways you can think about it, right? I can sit here and have a bit of a bit of a cry about it and go, oh, because of COVID, I've lost a whole bunch of money and just take that, that, that route or use the opportunity to look at the positives. Like, there is an opportunity here to be had where you can audit your entire business as far as processes, your sales, your sales team, your, you know, your internal resources, your delivery, whatever that may be, and use this opportunity to actually finesse it. So when you come out the other side, you're bulletproof. And you're going to make it tenfold. Like I've taken, what I've, as I run multiple businesses, one of them has taken millions of dollars of hit. But I said to the guys, you know what? I'm quite happy. And they look at me and they go, why? If this didn't happen, would we be auditing every part of the sales process, this process, the expense? And they said, no. I said, so whatever we don't get here, I'm going to get it back tenfold. But I'm also going to give a better service to the client. We've actually, we put on six people in the last, I think it was six weeks. We're about to put another seven on because it's all customer service. It's all about knowing the clients. And I see that as an opportunity. But look, we've, we said it at the start and we'll say it now. Getting through this mentally and ensuring that you're looking at things with the right frame of mind is so important. Now, I didn't ask you at the start, Robert, what were you like as a kid and what caught your interest in business? How did you get your, you know, why did you get into business? Was it, was it someone in your family? Is it someone you're just interested? Why did you get into business? That's a good story, man. It's, it's one of these typical, like, you know, parents, I'm uh, of an Egyptian background, both mum and dad, you know, one's a pharmacist, the other one's in, is an accountant, commerce, you know, very good positions in Egypt. They wanted a better life for us, right? So they thought, I don't, I don't know, like back, these type of, these, these countries, mate, when you've got two boys and one turns 18, they got to go straight to the army. And my mum was like, there is no way my sons are going to the army. My so she, yeah, exactly. So she pulled us out got us over here and, you know, and I saw the hard work that my parents did to start from scratch, right? They left their parents, their friends, their family, like everything behind, right? For a better future for us. So for me, it was like, I needed to, I owed them a big piece of my life, right? And I needed to, to I needed them to be proud of, I guess, um, of, of the decision that they made and to prove to them that they did make the right decision, right? That was one of my biggest drivers. Um, to be honest, no one in my business runs a, uh, sorry, no one in my family runs a business. Um, I've always, I've, ever since the day I uh, turned 13, has, have, had a, have had a job and I have not stopped working since. Um, so I think for me, what attracts me, I love the hustle and grind, right? And I hate using those two words, but I, love um, but, but I just, I love it, right? I'm always looking for the new, for the next opportunities. I'm always like, how can I disrupt this? Or how can I break that? Or how can I, you know, overtake this particular competitor? I think it's just something, I don't know, man, I think it's in my DNA. I think it's in my blood. I like that. Right. I saw Kobe uh, Bryant when he was doing an interview with Patrick Rick David. And then what he did, he was number 60 or 70. He wrote down the names of every single person that was above him. And he started going after one at a time until he was exactly. number one. So That's for right. me, look, I, nothing gets me out of bed more and gets me more trying to say, he's not going to make this. He's going to fail. This is tough. Nothing for me I love that makes me show up. So I love that. Now, uh, do you identify with it? Having the, the fact that you run a quite a large team, how, do you identify with a certain management style yourself? Do you are you more diverse? I'm very diverse and I adapt a lot. And 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 you know there, there is an argument there that you generally hire people that are very similar to you. Um, but again, you know I've got 65 very different, very different um, personalities, right? I've got creatives and then I've got techs. Some don't want to speak to anybody. Some want to speak to every single person. Right. So I think right brainers and left brainers. Exactly. So, you know, I think as a leader, um, you need to be very, you need to adapt, you know, you need to adapt to different personalities and different styles in the team. Um, I must say it's, it it has definitely been, been a, been a challenge for me, right. Hence I've, I've built now a team of, you know, we've got a senior management team um, who again are very different, different personality types. So I think as leaders, one of our biggest challenges is how can we be approachable? you know, very much an open door policy. So anybody can come and speak to us and for us to actually listen, listen to them rather than just, I'm your boss. You do as I tell you. You're um, a leader, not a boss, active listening. Correct. Which very. is very, very important. Right. Uh, but I think, yes, um, for, for me, I'm, I'm still mastering the art of dealing with different personalities and being able to, to, you know, resonate with certain people's feelings and the way that I speak to them and listen to them is very different from one to the other. Um, and that in itself is, is a bit of an art. And I think it just takes, time and experience 
You know, I don't think anybody... They asked the top CEO, what does it take to become a great CEO? And he said, good decisions. They followed up. How do you make good decisions? Experience. How do you get experience? Bad decisions. It's all a process. And it's it's exactly right. And it's important to identify, I guess. Now, I know you have an office overseas. Now, I'm actually one of my, my business coaches from this place. Why did you choose Austin, Texas to open an office? <laughs> I love this question. Um, look, a lot of the tech companies are starting they're out of the valley, are moving into, into Austin. Um, like your Alphabet, you know, your Googles, your Facebooks, your IBMs, your Microsoft, those guys. Now, there's obviously tax benefits. It's probably one of the biggest drivers. But really, the, big, the, the biggest one for us was uh, arguably one of the best universities in, in, in the US is from Austin. So the talent pool is unbelievable. You can pick up like some of the best talent out of the university for you know fairly affordable, um, and they're some of the smartest kids that you that you've probably ever met. So for us, you know, we're we're a human, we're very much a, a, a you know, human based business, right? We we're very, um, you know, given that we're, we're service based businesses, there's, 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 as I said, there's 65 people, and I'll imagine the Austin office will probably grow to, to, to similar, if not more. Um, so we need to be somewhere that we that can attract some very, very smart individuals. Very good. Right? Angle. Um, yeah. So we went to, to, to a place where, you know, great tax benefits and also, um, you know, great university, You're very smart, very smart people. You see, there's, um, there was a big dojo it had over 500 karate dojos and all they did, all their market research, they opened within 200 or 300 meters from a McDonald's because they know yeah, all the see, research is on there. So yeah. that's a very smart strategy and I really like that. Um, now, on a total side topic, I didn't know this about you, Mr. Robert Tadros, but you were a, a semi-professional skateboarder. <laughs> yes, I was. Now, yeah, you, I was. you mentioned energy. Like tracks, like, so usually friends like ourselves are attracted because we have similar traits, but it is important in business to surround yourself with different people. But obviously, as with friendships, you attract a certain like. So I never knew, A, you're a skateboarder, but B, you probably never knew that I skated either. No, I had no idea. Now, my brother was almost professional at 15. Almost went to, uh, so I know all the Bones Brigade, Tony Hawk, uh, St- St- uh, Steve <laughs> Carrera, Lance Mountain. Um, well, Vision, yeah, well, I had no Vision, idea. Vision Skateboard. My brother was 15 and almost went over to skate, skate for those guys. And I know Tony Hawk land, landed the first 900. So I was actually big into skating when I was nine. But when I went to Cyprus, there was no road, so I had to stop. So I can't <laughs> believe you were skating. Yeah, man. I um, I skated pretty much my whole life. Like, oh, man, I probably picked up a board when I was like nine or ten. Um, and the only reason I stopped, you know, I had the big dream of one day I was going to be on TV next to Tony Hawk. Um, at the age of 17, I landed on a, um, I was doing a roof gap and I landed on my right hip, um, lucky to actually probably be alive. Um, and I ended up in hospital and, you know, obviously my mum pulls me in at the age of 17 and the doctor essentially gave me an ultimatum and said, mate, you got two choices. One is you're going to need a hip replacement by the time you're 21, or you can stop right now, give it up and, and, and you'll be okay. Now, you know, what parents, of course I took option B, <laughs> so I had to stop. Um, but I must say, like, you know, it was probably some of the best times of my life. I, I was, I was doing some crazy shit, you know, crazy what, shit. Even what? looking back now, I was street skater. So I look back now and I was like, man, what was wrong with me? You know, so you <laughs> looked at Tommy Guerrero and people like that question. So did you know now there was a 13 year old that's landed a 900? No. 13 year old girl, girl. That oh, landed. actually I saw the video of this the other day. Tony Hawk was shooting it. Like, the, uh, I remember uh, Tony Hawk retired when he landed the 900 at the X Games, and now someone's landed 1,080, but threw it on a mega ramp. So when I heard that, I thought, I couldn't believe that. So there you go. There's something, uh, another thing we shared we never knew. Bloody hell, now, there you go. Yeah. It's cool. Are you ready for the challenge, the quick fire rounds, Mr. Tadros? Hit me. In the rock. Hit. All right. Hit me. You can answer or you can pass. There's 20 questions that are coming at you quick and fast. Do you have any pets? No. What's your favorite color? Blue. Me too. Do you know that every color has a meaning? Yes. Good. Uh, what's your favorite TV show? Don't have one. Okay. So let's say Seinfeld. 
There's no time for TV. <laughs> I don't really watch TV either, but Shine probably used to watch. What's your favorite movie? If anything, it'd probably be Suits. But again, I like while while you know someone else is in there watching TV, mate. I'm I'm working away. What's your favorite movie? Oh, um, I'll come back. Pass. Dark chocolate or milk chocolate? Dark. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Describe yourself in three words. Uh, supportive, trustworthy, competitive. I know you, so I'll, I'll second that. One <laughs> item you can't leave your house without, you can't say mobile. Uh, my underwear. That's important. <laughs> Unless you're going to a nude beast, you won't need it. Correct. Uh, what annoys you the most? Give me one pet peeve. Oof. Uh, people that lie to me. That's a, that's a, that's a good one. Best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, be present. That's be in the moment. Don't live in the past or the future. Otherwise, you'll have anxiety. I've got all the above. Um, now, if you could have one last meal, what would it be? Spaghetti bolognese. It's actually one of my favorite meals too. And it's cheap. So next time I take you, I'll take you somewhere. Done. <laughs> Hopefully one day soon when the restaurants open up again. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a while so I can save up, don't worry. If you went in the digital land space in what you're currently doing, yep, what would you do? Uh, I probably would have pursued architecture. George Costanza, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> um, if you left your house because it was on fire, you could run back in to get three things, what would you get? <laughs> My three watches. <laughs> Leave the kids and the wife to grab the watches. That's so funny. Well, hopefully they're out by then. <laughs> so we're assuming they're out. Okay. Name name a book that's positively influenced you. Oh, man. So many. Uh, Rework. If you want, but to start with the number one that had the biggest impact. Rework. By um, one, one of the founders that started um, um, uh, Basecamp, Project Management Tool. I should give you this book, actually. Uh, Never heard of that, man. I'm going to actually get that. Really? Yeah. No, I haven't. I'll give it to you. Oh, grab it. Grab it. It's an awesome book. Yeah. Changed the way on uh, on how I looked at my business and just challenging the status quo. Who would play you in a movie about your life? Who would play me? Yeah. Ooh. Pass. Man, that's if a hard one. Is, if so, where? Uh... <laughs> I would say Positano. All right. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Hold on. What was the question? If, if someone was to play me, where would it be? If, if someone was to play you in a movie, who would it be? Oh, your... who, would... Oh, who would it be? Sorry. Um... Oh, man, I've got no idea. I'm going to have to pass on that one. The follow-up question was, do you have any tattoos? If so, where? Yeah, I do. Yeah. On yeah. my arm. And... Okay. It's across. Yeah. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Um, oh, man. Superpower. Bloody hell, there's so many. Yeah, um, one. See, Sorry, see, seeing the future. Okay. You can become a good sports better. <laughs> if, you could, if you could go to dinner with three people, dead or alive, who would they be? Oh, definitely you, Chris. That's the first one. Uh, the Rock. Yeah, for now. The Rock. Uh, and Denzel Washington. Give me one more. Denzel Washington, The Rock, uh, and could it be anybody. Yep, anyone you want. God, if there is a God. Okay, no one's answered <laughs> that. Hey, but you know Denzel, Denzel and The Rock. You can't get two, but they're they're killer people. One yeah, strange man. fact nobody knows about you. One, sorry? One strange fact that nobody knows about you. Uh, I don't know if it's strange, but I'm terrified of heights. I was too. Mm. I um, yeah, and I'm, I'm not really um, anymore, but I, it, was, it was one of my biggest, uh, one of my biggest fears. So I, I jumped fear, out of so a plane. For the bungee jump. So yeah, same. I jumped, out, I jumped out of a plane. Now, I'm going to do that this year as well, but if anything opens up. If not, I'm just going to jump out of the balcony if COVID continues. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll get that anyway. <laughs> now, for, for those who are listening, <laughs> you could come with two, three takeaways. 
to this part? What do you want people to take away from what we said? Look, man, um, I think for me, uh, the biggest one right now, which is very time sensitive, is look after your team. Really do look after your team, right? Speak to them. You know, I make it an effort to actually talk to them as much as I can. I get on the phone, like you said before, Chris, something that you do as well, is just ring them up like, man, how are you going? Are you okay? How's things? How's family? You know, how are the kids? Don't even talk work because it is a, it's a very tough time for a lot of us, but especially for those that have been at home for the last six months. You know, it's very, very, very tough. Um, and then the second piece of advice, um, I guess, a bit of a takeaway is control what you can control. Um, and don't, fo don't focus too much on the things that you can't control. Because I think, again, as humans, we can get too caught up in, um, you know, making up stories in our head. Um, so I've always been a big fan and something that I'm working on is just being very present and controlling what I can't actually control and just forget everything else because you can't control it. So why think about it? One of my basic principles that I only focus on what I can control. And another thing that I do for work functions that I thought I'd bring it up, when we go out for work functions or drinks, I've got only one rule. Don't talk about work. Yeah. So when we go so to, important. It's just good to not be one dimensional. And also 100%. it's effective because you can be more, you can be more effective when you're focused on that one thing, which is nice. Now on a scale of one to 10, how much have you enjoyed this podcast? 10. That's been awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert, for coming on the show, man. I'm sure a lot of people learn a lot from your wisdom. I love watching your post. Follow Robert uh, Tadros on LinkedIn. If you need any digital marketing needs, go to Impressive. He's got quite a few businesses. And thank you very much for your knowledge and your time. And we'll put your links here so people can get in touch with you as well. What's the best way to reach you? Probably, look, shoot me an email. I respond to most emails, uh, robert at impressive.com.au. You can, um, and LinkedIn is probably my second source of, um, as, a, as far as a communication tool. Um, but thanks, Chris. It's been awesome, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks, yeah, man. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> me too, mate.